Today I was just, I wasn't even praying. I was supposed to be eating, but I couldn't eat. All I could do was cry and cry and cry and cry more for the pain that a lot of us are going through. Because I was young once in this same country. And I know the kind of hopelessness. If you would only leave us with hope in Nigeria, we'd be happy. It's that, 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 that cessation of hope. That feeling that nothing is ever going to work. That we hate. The fact that there is nobody there telling us. If you go through this with us, it's going to get better someday. And you are very sure. And you can see that it will be better. Then you can hang in there. Is that not it? If somebody would just cast a vision, if somebody would just say, I'm a leader and there is hope, and you actually believe that there is hope. Anyway, I'm here to tell you there is hope. There is hope. Yeah, there is hope. Um, I'm going to start the conversation with a sad story I heard a while ago, and I want us to see why those things happen. I heard this story about a young man, thank you, Sarko, about a young man who took sniper now and if we describe his story to people here some people might say they don't see why he should take sniper why will anybody take sniper in their 20s not in their 70s not in their 60s but in their 20s why will that happen i want you to start thinking because i want to ask that's what we're going to be discussing what can cause someone to decide that a good and then sniper is not even a good way to die I have a feeling it's painful. You know, I'm not going to recommend good ways to die to you. In case you are thinking, I'll tell you that instead of sniper, next time try. No. Can someone tell me a very bold person? Anybody bold enough? Yes. Give her the mic. She's setting the ball rolling. Thank you. I'm back with okay. you. Hello, everybody. Hello. So the reason why I see people committing suicide based on the number of um, intervention cases that I've been able to stop because I've had people call me at the point of committing suicide. And the, mo and the number one thing was um, there's always this idea of worthlessness, hopelessness, worthlessness, hopelessness. And it comes from um, um, like history or maybe past history of different mistakes, different art, different pain, different heartbreak. So, you know, um, and I put it, getting to that point where they finally decide to commit them um, to, to kill themselves is not because of maybe that immediate event or maybe because they lost somebody. It's because of a um, series of events that have happened in the past. So it's not like, you know, um, a reminder that, oh, you're a worthless person. You know, at the end of the day, you don't really make sense. At the end of the day, you're a very stupid person and nobody really loves you. At the end of the day, you deserve death. At the end of the day, you're not deserving of love. At the end of the day, you just kill yourself and end it. I mean, there's really nothing to life. So at really, the end of the day, you have to I, drop that mic. Thank you very much. You have tried. Clap for her. Clap for her. Who is going to be my book runner? There you are. She deserves a book. She deserves a book. She tried. Is there any reason on earth that can make a human being feel that hope, all hope, is lost? So there are so many reasons to different people, and we all view things from different emotional angles. Okay. But from my experience, and yes. because I'm lucky to be here today, I will tell you that hopelessness comes from being tired. From being? Tired. You, you've exhausted all your options. Everybody you know you can run to, you're starting to be a case of every time, is it only you? Mm. And you know that you don't just want to be that person. Yes. You know you've done it. You've done the ways that you know that you know how to do. Yes. Nobody gave you the manual map. Nobody said, oh, take, when you come to life, this is how it will be. Take the step. No, you, I'm, I'm a first daughter, I'm a firstborn, and I watched my, my mom's first hand story and there was nobody. I, I had to learn how to pray because I watched my mom pray and it helped her. So you get to that point and you can't. There's no, people are there, you can't just see them anymore. Your pain has risen to a point where it blinds you. It blinds you, clap for her, I love that. It's almost poetry. Your pain has risen to a point where it blinds you. Give her a hand. My goodness, was there any time in your life, JT, when your pain, before I deal with you today, right? When your pain rose to that point, <laughs> when it blinded you. I'm feeling you the pain already. And JT is my son. <laughs> <laughs> you like, mind your own business, is what we're saying. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't say to that level of hopelessness, but I think I got to a point in my life um, where I knew I was going to fail in life. Mm. Yes. 
It wasn't if, it was when. And it was about the circumstance, things going on with my, with my parents at that time, a lack of self-esteem. But like she said, I had options. My option was Jesus. Hallelujah. Somebody yes, ministered to me and that changed my life. Hmm. You, you are just too confident. I don't think, but maybe there was a time that you just felt hopeless. Not that it blinded you, but maybe just, you know, no. affected your eyesight. There's no time. Okay, we'll leave her out. And, and she feels bad that she has no story to tell, but it's okay, we'll come to your, we'll come to your side, you know. But when you tell people who feel hopeless, right, because they come to you, what do you have to say to them? You don't have personal stories, but you know, how do you help? What do you say? Okay, so... That to, has helped somebody. That has helped. To be honest, um, my, what I'm about to say, you know, is going to put me at the risk of being... Sound like an unkind person. But to you be honest... Love you. Okay. What I have utilized, you know, as a toolkit for people in a phase of life where they're feeling hopeless is around the principle of emotional agility. Hmm. Hopelessness will continue to grow because uh, generation after generation, we're handing people lesser and lesser tools hmm. to be emotionally agile. So this generation compared to the previous is more emotionally fragile. So an emotional agility or fragility is not just a, uh, is not just- Sorry, boss, which is why you think that JT and I can have problems. Because I said that. Because if it is you, you will never talk to me again. What has happened? What happened between us? I guess you are feeling the pain on his behalf and he's not feeling any pain. Why are we so fragile? Why must we always be praised? Why must it always be likes and likes and likes on exactly, Instagram? Exactly. And anybody who does not say you are looking beautiful exactly, hates you. Exactly. What if you are not looking beautiful and you need to adjust it? So that you can look beautiful tomorrow. That was a point. Sound bite. Continue. Exactly. It's it's really the summary. We are we are really in a, a type of crisis where people aren't taught how to expect expect hardship hmm. and how to, <laughs> and how to draw from their inner strength. Hmm. So without those tools of resilience, of taking hard feedback of starting mm. after you falling, those things are absent. So you're going to face situations that were meant to make you, but you're but going, to going to break Exactly. So, and if we don't fix it even now, we're still going to see this growing or rising stats with hopelessness and suicidal thoughts and all of that. If young people tell you what they're stressed about, you're going to be shocked about why it's a problem. Right? And then we even have... Uh, you know, parents, aside absentee par uh, absenteeism with parenting, we have parents who always think the only way they can be a blessing to their children is to praise them, you know, is to, is to make them feel like they're doing good. It's the fault of Dr. whatever that guy's name, Benjamin Spock or something, is giving us more, more problems than, you know, help. So, you know, we all have Jesus, JT. I mean, almost everybody here is in church. And when you and I were bantering now, they were feeling the pain for you and they're in church. So how then did you access Jesus? Because Jesus is there for everybody. Um, for me. And what does that mean? You know what I'm saying? So it's not a cliche so that we know how to. Yeah, I mean, I'd always been to church. Um, but I was, I needed help. And I tell people that, I think it was my 100 level. That was the time I was looking for a sense of belonging. I could have joined a cult, but they didn't just approach me at that point in time. I don't know why, but they didn't, if they had come, recruited immediately. Why would uh, you have joined a cult? Tell, tell the truth. I was looking for significance in life. Hmm. I didn't I feel that. I, I was. like that word. Keep that word somewhere, significance. Yes, and yes. I felt like they had power and control. And so by being a part of them, I accessed that also. And so a friend of mine had been inviting me to church. I had a different experience. I had an encounter with God. Just, I didn't plan it at all. And that day, I knew he was real. Yes. And that led me to exploring and discovering. And that changed my life totally. Yes. Fantastic. So, significance. What, what would give you... How can we define significance? Am I on track? How can we define significance? What does significance mean to you?
I strongly believe significance for me would be me being able to help everyone that comes my way. And helping them means in various capacities. So my time, my resources, um, kind of bringing people, bridging the gap between people who don't have and where they want to be. How old are you? Do you mind my asking? It's okay, it's okay. Because they're eligible people to hear, you know, if you just give us your age. This thing works various ways. My one is on Wikipedia, what do we do? So, I'm 26. 26, very nice age. So, but, ah, because you, what you said is sounding more like 46 or 56. 26. I had now, but that answer, oh. are you reading it from somewhere? No, I think um, having experienced life and I give kudos to GDK because it's resilience is something that really has helped me so far. Mm -hmm. And Jesus definitely. Life has thrown a lot of things, but I'm going to happen to life. Significance. Who else wow. has significance? It's always just people in the front. Oh my gosh. Why? Somebody at the back. Okay, because we're not penalizing people for being at the back. You, you can um, hurry up to people holding the mic. You need to look. So we make quick progress. Thank you. Uh, FG, you are keeping time for me, please. All right. Good day, everybody. Good day, darling. For me, what would give significance would be to be a solution to our generation in this era of hopelessness, providing, being an impact, sitting in a position like that where I can affect the minds of people positively, like impacting them with not just Jesus as an abstract phenomenon, but... Ha! Sorry, 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 it was just... Shh, it's the abstract... Thank you. Okay, not just presenting Jesus on a, as an abstract phenomenon, but being a practical solution to modern day problems. Something as hope in Nigeria. That would be. Cloud for internet! So, do, let's be honest. Do many of us think that Jesus can, is an abstract phenomenon? Let, let's, wait, they, we're not voting here. It's not a, a PC or PDP. Can this talk of Jesus come across as abstract sometimes for you abstract do you mind talking no abstract sometimes okay how can we make jesus real in your you know i'm go i'm coming for you too yeah. real uh, because that's what we do for instance awesome treasurer say people of faith in the marketplace that is what salt is about making your faith relevant i notice that a lot of people have a problem bridging the gap between church on sunday thank god for covid church on sunday is no longer a thing really and life in the marketplace so it's like two separate compartments all right um being real the closest people will get to jesus a lot of times is when they meet you so they are they as you get converted and you are transformed people are experiencing god um, somebody might wonder why is it that you know I came late because I had to be somewhere and I something happened and I felt bad, but I know she loves me. Uh, too much. Too much. Mm -hmm. So that only she will flog me, we will hug after. Listen to me. Flogging. I'm not violent like that. <laughs> and I said that for a reason. Being Jesus, being real is, I mean, the biggest expression of Him is love. Mm. Biggest expression. And what that means in the workplace is that when you even correct your subordinates, you correct them in love with the desire to see them improve and to grow. You get into government. You want people to experience love. And that is expressed in doing good things to them. So we have to move from a place where we're trying to get disciples that quote scriptures, disciples that are scriptures. We have to move, make that move. And it's very urgent. You know, so that's what I think it is. So you are in the workplace, you're in the marketplace, you're in the boardroom. As Christ, as he is, so are we in this world. And so it's important that we understand that the concept, I think the major challenge is that we have church members, but disciples. Mm -hmm. And that's a big problem. And so when we can have disciples, disciples by nature, they carry the character of the person who is their master. And that it's easier to flow. It's going to be an easy question for you with someone like Imashon, you are massive coaching. You need to ace this. You need to ace this. You are the only pastor here, so you are in trouble. You know, the rest, we, we are not pastors. So what then is church doing? You have church, and we have a Nigeria full of church people who are not disciples. 
And Jesus said, she's nodding. I'm making sense. Yeah? <laughs> and this, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. You are the one representing church in this room. What is church doing? Not in Mashon Kuchi. Church. What is church doing to make sure that disciples, and if church is not doing it, what should church be doing? Thank you. So that's, that's, that's really a setup. I don't know why I would sit in this space and be representing church. But the only pastor. <laughs> what JT shared is so profound. And indeed, the answer is in discipleship. Because if we truly become the one that we follow after, that's the only way we carry him mm. uh, to a society and a generation. My thought about what the church should be doing, because there is in discipleship, um, the first thing is the transition from my agenda to God's agenda. Mm -hmm. Those who are, or those who have had the opportunity, I'll say that with caution, the church could have found itself in a place where a lot of its leaders uh, temporarily transitioned into building their own dynasty unconsciously. It became about who's got the larger building, who's got the more excellent media, uh, how many people are following us, and we got distracted. So we have to find our way back to remembering that the only owner of the kingdom is God. The moment those transitions begin to happen, we will break the denominational divide. As long as it's your dynasty, you're counting in the numbers of those who belong to that dynasty. But as the moment that transition is, transition is made into God's kingdom, we'll break the de denominational divide. The next thing that would immediately happen is we'll begin to engage culture and engage our community. And that is when discipleship has power. That what you do on Sunday and in the midweek services, uh, you, know, you then carry it over into your community, into your workplace and your family. Well, when I gave my life to Christ, I wasn't discipled. Because um, my father, I'm not going to say late father, I'm not going to say that. My father, being an intellectual, didn't understand what I was doing amongst those issues. When I was born again, in our days, it was not fashionable to be a Christian. It was not. Now, if you're not a Christian, people say, so what are you? You know, but then, I mean, I remember people will follow us from, you know, if White House, <laughs> that is science building, anybody who knows IFE, all the way to something like a great complex lecture theater, to say, ASU, ASU. This behind, yes, we're working and they're chanting that. It was a real bad thing. You had to actually carry the reproach of Christ. So you, you can imagine that time. Now, nobody then, I had no access to fellowship because my father wouldn't let me go. And I was, because I got to university at 14, I was at home at 15, 16. So you had to break jail to actually go to fellowship. And I couldn't go. Thank you, Dr. La, for nodding, Jerry. And so it became my responsibility to build myself up. So, you see, there's another thing I find about things. I don't want to say it generally. It's like, there's a lot of points in my mother's shield, my pastor's shield. President Buhari should, Sarko should. A lot of people owe us, you know, your hand up. Nobody, be, okay. So I built myself up. I read every single book Kenneth Hagin has written. I'm not joking. 1917, where? McKinney, Texas. What happened? I'll give you. I read those books to the point that I was a real disciple. So what can we do to take personal responsibility for our own success? What can we do? What See, I believe is that we should start by transforming our minds. We should leave the religion. We should leave those things that we used to learn when we were younger that are not really applying today and start looking for things that will make out for the real success in us by looking inside and bringing out what we have inside. It's, it's a good attempt. It's a good attempt. I like that. Lady? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Oyin Damola. So um, my personal journey, I found I had to look for significance in this world. Okay, so I was lost, right? And I had so many questions and I had no answer to them. Pause. Please elaborate on you were lost. Okay, so um, growing up, I had the notion that we just had to be in this world, you know, grow up, get a job, marry and die and that's just it, right? And I started growing up and I started getting faced with challenges and I was stunned. I didn't know what to do. And the only resource for me was Jesus, right? 
because he just came to me really i didn't look for him he came to me i was going to church yes i knew he, he existed but i just knew I, I just cried to him and i asked him to help me Good. and he helped me exactly. i don't know how he to explain this right mm -hmm. he just came and he helped me and that was how i believed him and i said asking questions and so that's how i came across you i came across ddk and i started watching your videos and so many things and i, re I began to understand what life is about and so i started to learn for myself mm -hmm. what life is about i started to learn what i should do i started to learn how to do it and that's what brought me here so you went on a personal quest yes please. write it down yes you took clap for her clap for her because she watched my videos give her a book the guy so she let me recap because what she said is very important she decided to go on a personal quest she took responsibility nobody forced her into a bus and dragged her here she found her way okay there was a guy who wanted to talk yes my name is Ola Olua. good afternoon everyone good afternoon i'd like to follow from where she stopped going on that personal quest yeah sometimes it is not something you feel like doing mm. e.g you wake up in the morning you know you should read your bible but you don't feel like reading that bible sometimes you have to force yourself to do these right things because of the bigger picture what's the bigger picture you are a building in the making that god himself is building you didn't have that sound but he had it Beef is in the room. We have to cast out the spirit of beef. You know. <laughs> and so, in the process of pushing yourself forward, even when you don't feel like it, just do it. You will find the sense of meaning. Just do it. Hmm. Your journey to meaning, when did it start? Uh, that would be 1996. Okay. Um, when I received the life of Jesus Christ, mm. I was in junior secondary school, senior, and you did I preached the gospel to me, and I started to study the word, and I started to preach uh, the gospel to others, and I remember that I was always called an evangelist, mm. you know, um, from that early age. But I feel like when the real journey to meaning began would be in my first day in the university, we had this 11 month break mm. and I read every book written by Mike Modoc. 28 of them. I read all the books I could find by Mike Modoc. And that, that uncovering of who God is began by him showing me who I was in him. And I was fascinated about that image he was showing me of who I could become, what he, he could do with me. And I thought, let's do this here. So there's a thread running through. We access resources for ourselves because nobody can force you to access resources. We went for meetings, we got books, we read, we watched YouTube. If there was YouTube in my days, my goodness, my goodness, I will not have graduated, I'm sure. Architecture, how will I graduate architecture? When I can watch Kennedy on what is architecture compared to that? We used to get those, those, those tapes that we used to use. Uh, you don't understand. You put it back. Once you don't understand, they say. Yeah. And we were passing it from one person to the other. Whoever goes to camp meeting in Tulsa and comes back, you touch the hem of their garments. Yeah, because men, they really went and they saw Rema and they saw Can I take him from afar? Ah, those who were angels. Oh. How did you start your own? Um, interesting, in 1996 also. And that's when I had that experience. Um, but something significant happened to me. My dad traveled to America and I was expecting him to buy me good stuff. Then he comes back and brings me a Bible. And I was disappointed. It was terrible. I know. <laughs> and um, there was that long break and then there was no light. So I had to look for something and I just saw the Bible. It's a parallel Bible. And I read most of the book, Bible. There was no light, aka there was no TV. Yes, exactly. No TV. No distractions, essentially. Yes. And that got me to a place that provided a foundation. Mine was a bit different. So I joined a church. And so the pastor would get those messages, photocopy of books those days. Yes. Exactly, yes. And the tapes. And so I'll be listening to them. And that became my journey. I think that one key thing, you know, relating this to what we're talking about, 
is that every global standard product must go through a stress test. And what has happened is that a lot of people are trying to be global without the process. Mm. That's, a, that's a problem. And the, th the thing about the process is that many times you have to choose to go on it. Yes. So I am sure everybody here is having their personal opportunities, but not everybody is making a choice. My goodness. That's what I think might be a I challenge. I don't know what to even say. I was having a conversation with DDK about an emotionally fragile 30-something-year-old, which is a disgrace, because that's supposed to be an adult, right? And I was saying to this person, you have two choices. You either go through the stress or keep avoiding it. I'm coming back seasonally and perennially to the same exam. So you can choose because there is no promotion without examination. So you can choose to write the exam now when you're young. Like if you write all levels at 15, 16 to 18, let me tell you it's easier. If you try anybody here with all levels, we might fail. Meanwhile, we know it. Do you understand? When you do things when you should do it, there's a kairos, there's an open time. When the, 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 the stress comes, take it at that time because that's when you are wired, engineered, and you know, put together to take that stress. If you avoid it, you will sit that exam again. So let's stop avoiding pain. Did you just say that? Pain is a necessary part of growing up. So I know a lot of us have avoided pain. Your friends say something, you don't like what they say, you don't talk to him again. Your boss says something, you don't like what they say, you resign. So you keep avoiding anywhere where there is pain. But the journey to destiny is through the path and the value of pain. That's just what it is. Dr. Ola, we're coming to you now. No, you don't need Mrs. to clap. A. I'm actually very confident enough to know I just made the point. So, <laughs> I want to ask you something. Yes. Or I want to introduce a thought that I feel like is so important for our generation. You know, you just said you can't... This is not your generation, by the way. You know, just because, in case you're feeling... Because I'm wearing jeans. Yeah, you know, you carry, get carried away because you're wearing jeans. I know. Cars. It's all right. But. <laughs> so, you know, you just said, look... For you to step into destiny, there's a process. Mm. That process involves pain. Mm. If you keep bypassing that pain, you're going to, you know, sort of elongate your path. The challenge is that this generation has a distorted view of destiny. So if a person is, is, is if a person has quite a number of followers, they are creating these products, selling these services, logo intact, excellent branding, fantastic website, four members of staff or 12, they're traveling to Dubai and Seychelles, living in a gated estate. They feel like they're in destiny. And so when they're walking away from any seeming opposition to their existing sense of identity that is built on superficiality, they're not thinking, I'm bypassing destiny. They're thinking, maybe I, already I, have, a cheap I, destiny, I have destiny. So I don't need this. What is destiny? What is purpose? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My yes. name is Cheryl. Um, personally, what I believe purpose is, is really finding your role in God's big plan. <laughs> Just like that, you didn't even look at any book. Yeah, I think that's really what it is. When you find what the bigger picture is and what, what part you have to play, whether it's big or small, it's easy for you. Your sense of identity is acute. You know what's not for you and what's for you. Your ability to make boundaries is, you know, your wisdom is uncanny. You know, it's just easy for you to go ahead in life. So once you find out what the part you play in God's purpose and you accept it, that's another thing. You have to accept it hmm. per time and per season of your life as you work with everything God gives you per time. Yeah, it will be easy I for you. I feel like giving him a standing ovation. Does anybody, if you don't have anything to add, it's okay. Oh, but if you're, if you have a different view, different, it has to be different. It's different. Okay. I'm greatness. Good afternoon, everyone. So I see purpose and destiny as the essence for my spiritual gifts, the core of my heart, which is my motive, what drives me, the reason why I have every set of abilities that I have. The reason why my personality is different from every other person around me and the reason for my experience because they are valid to my assignment. Thank you. It, it's well said. It's not different, but it's like an elaboration. Yeah, I'm saying this because this is why sometimes we can 
maybe not pass exam eh, but it is an elaboration and i like it it's an elaboration i like it so do we see that in this generation the sense of emptiness is what do people do to feel that emptiness that is beginning to look it's actually like a an emptiness of significance an emptiness of of, of purpose what do your friends not you no you you can look at what you do to fill the emptiness you are here so it's not you those your friends who did not come yeah. what do they do to feel that emptiness yeah the lady her hand went up bam, because she has an answer thank you can you give a hand to dsk thank you there she is there she is your name my name is tara um so i see from this generation that a lot of people are filling up the emptiness in their lives with um, externals so people indulge their senses in their sex there's drugs there's um, material things that money can buy there's trips there's external validation the words spoken over their lives by other people the endorsements the accolades um, a lot of people feel their emptiness yes. good yes. I like you Tara a lot of people feel their emptiness as well with um, perceived like over exaggerated sense of self. Mm. So people um, turn to creating personas, um, representations of what they think they are, who they think they've become, and project this for the world to see so that they become elevated in the eyes and in the minds of other people. These are some of the things that I've noticed people feel the emptiness with. Can we clap for her? So Dr. Ola, are you going to give us, can we have someone come up and talk to us about what they try to fill their emptiness with? Yeah, come. Can you give her a hand as she comes up? My name is um, Erica and I just turned 27 this Monday that passed. Okay. I'm a single mother with two very big boys. My first born is going to be nine in August and then my second born will be five in November. So I'm practically going to tell you my story and then everything I will say boils down to what I've been saying since. So I grew up a lonely child. Um, my parents were really never there. They were all about money, money, money. So they were always working. I don't see my parents. This isn't going to work because I'm going to have to ask you questions. So you need to flip. You understand. Thank you. Give her a hand. So when you say your parents were not there, they didn't leave at home? No, they leave the home. Because I want us to see what gets. So what? They leave the home, but I barely saw them. Like by the time I wake up, I wake up like six, and then my parents are out like five. And then um, I sleep by eight, nine, and my parents come back around eleven. So I barely see them. job. Were they bankers? No, 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 no. My sorry, all the bankers, give them a hand. I'm married to one. I'm just asking, you know. They work hours. Uh, well, my parents actually worked with expatriates, so they were always traveling and all of that. So okay. I can only That's say I see them a month is I think thirty or thirty one days. I can see them only three times, four times. They didn't even come for PTA meetings, uh open day. So there was there was a pattern. I started, uh, I was lonely, so there was really no one to talk to. Did you have siblings? At that time, I was the only one. This, I'm saying this at the age of four, five. I was already sensitive at that time. And my immediate um, younger sister came when I was five, six. So I was alone and just the house help and all. So, um, when I was nine, I finished uh, primary school and my mom decided that because of what was happening with Jam, that she didn't want her daughter to go through that stress. So she decided that taking me abroad, like when I say abroad, America or whatever, is far. So she took me to Ghana, thinking she would be coming to have the chance to come and see me. So, I was, so your parents were well, okay. I mean, yes, they, they were. were comfortable. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So at nine, I was, in, okay, let's say 10, nine and a half, 10, I was in the boarding school in Ghana. I didn't have any family member. So uh, my mom decided, because she had a colleague who was a Ghanaian, and she had extended family. Her sister's um, husband was a pastor in Ghana. So she decided, she told my mom that there are some um, holidays 
can come, like Easter holidays, midterm. Instead of me coming back to Nigeria, I should just, you know, stay with those people. Those people would be like my guardian. And I really didn't have a say. Even my dad didn't uh, have a say because he, what he said was, uh, my mom knows what is best for me. You know, so he just allowed her to make decisions. So in Ghana, uh, it was tough, you know, in another man's country where they barely speak English, you know, except, except maybe when we're in class, teacher is teaching. We, they barely spoke English in the dormitory. So I, under three months, I had to learn the language, learn three languages in six months in Ghana. That's my first six months in Ghana. I dedicated that time to learn the language. So um, when I was 13, I was sexually abused by, uh, by my guardian. And he went on for three years till I was 16. So from the time it started, I had lost my virginity. And you know, girls in boarding school, you know, we talk, we talk about things. And when I'm 18, I want to lose my virginity. I want to do this. I, want... I didn't, that was when I felt lost. Because at that time, what I knew about being a woman, you being a woman is your virginity. That is what makes you a woman. And you're not meant to lose it till you get married to the right man. But then I had already lost it. So I felt what made me, me, was taken away from me and forcefully taken away from me. But I couldn't tell anybody about it because he threatened to kill me. So there are even times where I talk to my mom on the phone and I try to hint her. And she'd be like, keep quiet, Joe. Keep quiet. You are lazy. You don't want to do anything. And then she would just collect the phone and that she, like my mom shouldn't mind that, you know, she, I'm just becoming, uh, I'm becoming and all of that. Now, my mom didn't teach me how to cook. She didn't teach me how to do anything. In that house and in school, I learned how to do all those things. But I learned it the hard way. It's like, you're, I'm, not, I'm not doing it because I want to learn it. I am being punished to do that thing. That was how I learned everything. Even to me till today, she knows. House chores for me is really not... Uh, I would do it, but you can't force me to do it if I don't want to. Because I feel like if you force me, it's as if you're punishing me. And it takes me aback. So I couldn't say anything about it. And it started affecting my life. Now, I needed approval. I was already having, I was already having issues with um, uh, love. I needed love. I needed approval. And uh, the first people I could turn to were the bad ones. These were people that uh, would jump school fans, uh, would do all sorts. They won't come to class. And I joined them. And then they accepted me and they embraced me. And I felt loved. I felt like... Uh, I had some I had some people like so I was just doing absurd things I was always being suspended in fact a whole lot of things happened so when I entered uh, about when I was writing my senior YA that was when I got pregnant with my first boyfriend I came back my mom took care of everything she said no your life will not end here go back to school so three weeks after I gave birth, I got admission to Hujigbe North American University, Kotonu. So I didn't breastfeed. I didn't do anything. I went to school. So when I got to school, I already have. I already had another picture for myself. I was the bad person. So I didn't. I don't have to go and start looking for people that go to church or people that go to class. I have to look for people that like like minds. And then my roommate used to smoke. She was smoking, she used to smoke cigarettes. And, but when I was in secondary school, I already tried smoking cigarettes. In fact, please, I did it for like three months. So coming to university, my roommate was smoking marijuana. She used to go for parties and all of that. And then I was like, okay, why not? Since I've already started smoking cigarettes, there's no big deal now. So I started smoking marijuana. We started going for parties and all of that. So at the parties we're going to, you know, there's always rooms, different rooms for different people. People that just smoke the people that just smoke marijuana, people who do refno and codeine, and then people who do crack cocaine. 
So at that party, I learned how to take codeine and pop pills. That's retinol. I I took tramadol, but it wasn't really. I was like, this thing is too cheap. I beg. Why would I be? Why would I be doing cheap drugs? No, no, no. I need. I was like, ah, I'm too big for all of that. And my mom was pumping money for me. She, there are times where in the middle of I will be high and I will call her and I will cry. Like, is money a I will send money. She doesn't want to know what has happened. She knew that my problem. One second. I want. I am not disturbing the flow. Who was at the last awesome? Do you remember when I asked the question, what do you want, your parents or money? Do you remember? Good. Thank you. Go on. So she will always send money. So, and I took advantage of that. I stopped going for classes in my 200 level. In fact, I think the only exam I wrote was um, 100 level first semester, 100 level second semester, 200, I didn't write. But I stopped paying my school fees because they would send me my school fees. And I was collecting double of my school fees. I even told her I didn't want to stay in the school hostel. I wanted to stay off campus. They sent Wait, didn't she come and visit? She only came twice. The first time she came was when I was getting the admission. And then the second time was when I was about to do my birthday. And that was it. And she didn't know anybody in school, maybe lecturers, maybe head of department, like parents. You know, some parents are really inquisitive. They want to know the, the, their children's Like My mom didn't even bother about all of that. She knew, fine. So far as I was, she was giving me money, I was okay. So, in my 200 level second semester, I started doing crap. So, when I started doing crap, that was when everything started happening as in i stopped going to parties i stopped doing i i stopped having a social life like maybe you get up in the morning you have your bath and you dress up like a girl you do makeup maybe you want to fix your hair and all of i stopped doing all of that mine was to wake up in the morning wear joggers wear slides go to the dealer buy crack come back smoke when I finish, I go back again, come back. I can do that for straight one week without sleeping. I have done 14 days straight without sleeping. And I had friends around and we just lock ourselves in the room. Now, I became late with paying my rent. So I had to pack out. Please, a normal human being would look where to go to. I came back to Lagos. I still told my mom I was in school. I was calling her with a Nigerian number. And she, why are you? Mm, I'm roaming my sim so I can call you with a Nigerian number. Sometimes I will come to the house around 8 in the, mid, in the night. And I'll tell her I'm going back to Kotonou today, today. I just need money. I want to do this. I want to do that. One course. I had carryover. She will give me ATM. I will withdraw money. And I will go. But I'm not going to Kotonou. Here in Lagos. In fact, I was here. Uh, Marwa here. This is where I was. And dealers will be sitting with you and then they'll make you feel comfortable and you are spending money, 300,000, 400,000, and you will not eat, you will not even buy gala with that money. That's just the funniest part. Now, when the money now finish, you'll not tell the dealer, I need 100 naira. They can slap you. So, let me do you. But, and that will get you angry and you want to go out and you want to look for money. Now, Time had passed. My mom was already counting it for me. 400 level project. So when she now said product, I said, good. You have given me format. I told her that uh, there's somebody that wants to do my project for me. And he said, I want to collect 120,000. I said, hmm, okay. She sent the money. And I told her three weeks later that uh, the person scammed me. So another person now said, this one is from, from my department. He said he's going to do everything. How much? 70,000 she was sending. What was the way out though? I was on the street. I For left. How long? At least uh, I went to my first rehab. I spent three months. Well, I was who took speaking. you to rehab? My parents. How did they know you needed rehab? They knew, they got to know I was smoking after my second child. They knew I was on drugs. And funny enough, some of my friends tried to blackmail. I used, I, I used to say blackmail so that they can get money from my parents. So they will tell my mom, I'm at Ikodo, Ikeja, I'm smoking, I'm doing crap. And my mom will call me and I say, God forbid. What is that? God forbid. I'm not doing that. I would deny it. So she already had the hint and everything. So when I had my second child, she, 
she they, someone one of the dealers called her that you're picking up they can't carry on so she planned with them at lagos island then they came to, they took me to sorry where in lagos island you are in lagos island Massey. sleeping where inside the joint <laughs> so um they came and took me i went to rehab i stayed three months there i came out i got clean i was clean for a year in fact i even had a job but the thing is i had issues when i say issues not so i had social issues i had mental issues you know i had emotional issues i haven't forgiven myself i haven't moved on i haven't accepted the kind of person i had low self-esteem i still needed that same approval i hadn't i had not dealt with that problem so i found that i went back again i relapsed and then i went deeper it's like when they say um when uh there's a part in the bible that says when uh, jesus healed seven was that was how i was in fact i think when i relapsed i wasn't up to i wasn't weighing up to 40. yes i was like i wish i brought, i didn't bring i was that time so i was now on the streets of lagos my parents didn't know my for two years they didn't hear from me and i know that at that time my father my father's mindset was i was dead and nobody and the funniest part is the church i also had issues with the church because i had friends in the church that went to the same school and they also did the same things i was doing i was doing but because my own escalated and everybody got to know so they started pointing fingers and i knew that they were now withdrawing from my parents they didn't want to have anything to do with my parents because they felt my parents were and i used to tell my mom something that these same people that you are funny your you know what their children are doing is it because i don't want to talk you know i saw, i kept saying that and then um i was on the street for two years i was sleeping in the joint and then one day you no know, normally the only the way we feed our our, our cravings our urge to take crap you go on the streets of lagos you beg you tell people some very talk and boo story and the funniest thing is the people will always pay you people who do know they finish for Lagos. just try and tell somebody one very silly story you will see that the person will give you 50 000, 70 000. They have, have collected even more than that but where am i using what am i using it for? i use it to smoke and when you now finish you will not beg dealer dealer give me 100 naira. they will not beat you up so there was a day um i went out i came back then um sister doctor they came for evangelism they came and they were talking about it in as in my conscience was telling me that this is not the life meant to be when you now again everything so the people they came to pick i was meant to go with them but i missed it at that time so i had to wait again for another six months in fact i even forgot about it then one other man came he was representing fountain of um, fountain of life but he was also working adam and then he saw me that day and he sat and he was looking at me. He said, what is your name I said, Eric, are you what tribe i said Aquaibo. but i was born and brought up in league he said you know you're beautiful why are you wasting your life like this and he started telling me you know he was encouraging me and telling me that he also did drugs this same place i'm sitting here sat down there for a good 20 years but he's out of it and now he wants to help people come out of it i said oh, okay no problem that i'm is he sure that i'm going to get i said uh -uh. he said if you are convinced on your own that you want to get clean you're going to get clean and he said you're not even going just going to get clean you're going to find purpose for yourself i said okay that moment i gave him my mom i told him to call my mom and tell my mom i erica said that i am tired I don't want to smoke again and before that i've had series of events that would have taken my life i had this i have this injury here i entered one chance i went to beg for five thousand something I entered one chance at around Chibo, and it was one chance so they tried to struggle with me and they pushed me out of the a moving bus it was god that saved me I'm, i was meant to go to the hospital i didn't go I went to the I'm joint. I'm going to, because of time, I think you may even have to come back to the next <laughs> awesome. So what was it that you found in Kadam that made the difference? That rehab didn't have? 
everything else they didn't have. If you're going to put it in a nutshell, what did you find? Well, Padam is actually a faith-based rehab. It's not like every other rehab. It's a rehab where you deal with everything, your spiritual, your biological, your social, your psychological, every aspect. So, and it's one year. So that one year, I used it to find myself from the grassroots, like from the foundation. Know what was, I had to know what was wrong with me. And I dealt with it. And I found Jesus there. Hallelujah. So that one year, it was really tough. There are days whereby, there were days whereby I wanted to go. I said, I'm not doing this thing again. I'm tired. After all, if I die. Eh? But again, I will not think. If you if you get clean, are you doing it for somebody or you doing it? So you took personal responsibility, yes, I even took, in the rehab. Yes, that this is not for your mom. Yes. This is not for your dad. It was this for is me. For Erica, Erica deserves a yes. better life. For Erica, that's it. Amazing. That's what kept you going, uh, and that is what is still keeping me going. At least I've been clean for three years now. And you'll be clean forever. Amen. That's it. Because that's why we testify. So that God can perfect. I don't know. I want to. We might have to wrap up here. But what I love. <laughs> Erica. Thank you for your honesty first. Thank you. Because we need people like you to tell us the truth. So that we don't even start the journey at all. We don't even start with Koden. You know because it's not going to end anywhere. You know, we don't start with all the palliatives and what Tara was saying, significance, likes, nothing. Erica, can you clap for Erica? No, you have tried. I salute you. But it, it had to take God for you to be in a fog and realize in that fog that you know I'm better than this. Somebody needs to tell them, says, I'm better than this. You are not answering, I'm better than this. If you are going to tell us one thing that you came out with rehab from, you know, what, what, what then would you say your purpose is now? That's where you are now, Erica. One sentence. One yes, Pat. Growing up, if you, you know, when you ask children, what do you want to be in the yes. future? Actually, never had anything. I can't say, I never said I want to be a doctor. I never said, I'll tell you, I don't know. But one thing I noticed is, I love to talk. Like, I love to encourage people. I love to talk. So, going on this journey made me realize something. That my purpose is, since Jesus has saved me, yes, he's going to use me. I am his testimony. Amen! He's going to use me <laughs> to change other people. That is my purpose oh in life. Oh my goodness. There's nothing left for me to say. My God, what a story that you are his testimony. For him to have allowed you to be alive to tell this story. She's glad she's here. And you see, to a massive crowd, you didn't start small. <laughs> and you know, I've spoken to people, but uh, no, this, I know this is awesome. This is how it is. Awesome. Can you give yourself a hand? I'm going to take one sentence. Maybe from JT and one from DDK. When did you have an aha moment too about what you should do? We're wrapping up. Erica, I'm coming to you last, last. One word of encouragement is what you're going to give us. So I want you to be composing it to young people. No, no, not to older people who know what to do. To young, if you're going to give us one word, one word, that's what you are going to just be thinking. You know, you, you are God's testimony. You will fill your mouth. So, what, when was your happening that you said, this is my purpose, this is what I want to do? If you're going to put your purpose into words, what will it be? Um, 2001, yeah. April 24, asked God the week before to talk to me about my purpose. Yes. He did. Hallelujah. He told me something about what I'm doing today. Mm. And it was totally different from who I was then. It has driven everything that I Totally different from who it was then. Was there any point at which you had uh, kind of epiphany that this is the direction I'm going to be going in? Beyond that, I'm an evangelist already. Yes. <laughs> I could choose 
maybe about three different yes. significant moments. Because it keeps, actually, to be honest. Yes, yes there have been significant moments. But I feel like this is an important day in my life. In 2003, mm. I sat at an awesome in Amphitheater in OEU. Mm. And there you stood on that stage, really screaming on top of your lungs at oh a point. I'm like, she's actually shouting good. at us. That's not very good. But you were, your heart was burning. And you, I you, shan't scream today. Yes, you continue to say, do not be small. Oh. Yes, you continue to say that. Do not be small. Make that decision today. You know, for God, I sat at the back and I was wailing. I was overcome with a desire to do I'm something myself. for God. And in that moment, that was the first time he said to me, he said, if you make that choice not to be small and to go all the way for me, I'll make you a light out of Africa to the ends of the earth. And next day it will be 20 years. We don't say it often, but Mrs. A, thank you. Oh, no, that's what I expected. Thank you. So 20 years, I'm back at Awesome speaking. Even though it's, I mean, I'm still at the small beginnings of what he said. But for me, what I don't, two things I really hope I can push to you today. The first is that your life counts yes. in a really significant way. But it always begins with this consecrated decision. As you see here. Consecrated yes. decision. Yes. Yes. God literally breaks upon the moment where you say, okay, I'm going to go all the way. I don't have the answers. I don't feel qualified. I've got this funny background. Whatever your own excuses are. And there's no better way to preach that message than Erica. Your life actually counts. And from the moment you make that consecrated decision, God breathes on that moment and it starts to carry you on this exciting journey. The second thing is don't be here. Don't be in this relationship with God for the short term. We've really been sold an unhealthy ideology about what it means to have God's favor on our lives. God's favor means in 20, 30, 40, 50 years, what is put on your inside will begin to carry generations and carry the nations. So don't be short term about your estimation of what God is working out of you. Yeah. It might not look like so much is happening, but as you stay the course with God, 5, 10, 20 years, on and on, let's be here for the long haul and you would have no reason to regret this commitment you're making. Fantastic. Let's now end with Erica. I need to say something now. We don't know the meaning of the word consecration. Consecration means there might be nothing in it for you. To be honest, there's really nothing in this for me. I thought about it. I cried and cried this morning. I was supposed to be eating. I don't know. I, I didn't eat. I have witnesses. I just wanted, I, I couldn't eat. I was just like, here we go again. DDK sent me a message. She didn't know that it made me think that I've been at this for so long. Is what I was thinking. For so long. Decades. Why? Nobody is paying me. So how did we become that generation that they must give you something? Even to help yourself. If you fail, you fail for yourself. If you succeed, you succeed for yourself. God forbid, if something had happened to Erica, she has a sister. The mother will start with the sister. Today is the day you take responsibility for your own life. I will succeed for myself. It doesn't matter how many likes I have, which, which is when it stops mattering. If they like your like or they don't like your like. Look at what the likes have turned us into. You lower your cleavage a bit, they like it 5,000. You say, let me lower it. Before you know, you are naked and you're getting a million likes. So, Erica, you are one word, one sentence for us today. Young people who are 13, 16. There's a book that I'm going to give out to the first hundred. I'm giving you time to think again. The first hundred to come here. Are they here? I said I wanted them here. Give out Auntie Debola's free book. Um, uh, sorry, book on free. It's a 6,000 naira book. I just need you to know that I value you. So my own book, the Temtokwa come with my book. I have to explain what happened. So you understand how interesting excellence is, is to me. Erika, you are rounding up for us. You are that important. God's testimony. Dr. La, well done. Can you celebrate Dr. La from Kadam? Can you rise? 
That's not why you do what you do. Can you start giving out free to the ladies? We'll give the men something different. To the ladies, give out free. It's about true stories of women who have been sexually molested. If they had read this book, if Erica had read it, maybe should have taken another route. We keep quiet about it too much, you know. Free is what you are giving out to the girls. Free, free, free. Mrs. Fagwamila, do you have enough copies? Let's do it sharply, please. Free. Thank you. While Erica begins. And then the men you give appointment with Destiny. Dr. Lam wants to say something. Come quickly and say something, please. Thank you. No, you won't be seen. Give her a hand. You won't be seen. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I just want to add that um, for the youth, please try to be comfortable in your own skin. Be who you are. Don't care what anybody is saying about you. Erica did drugs because she wasn't comfortable in her own skin. I did drugs because I wasn't comfortable in my own skin. I wanted to be like somebody else. But I'm happy today. I've been clean for 18 years. 18 years. Yes. And um, I've been doing, all I've been doing is this. And going all about the joints, you know, helping God to bring out his own people. Just one question Thank for you, Dr. Lab, because you didn't plan to be here. Yes. Um, on, on this spot. So what joints were you in? Because you don't look like... All over. What do you mean? <laughs> Just tell me what joints... In, inside I go don't to. know the joint. Tell okay. me, I was going to get at level. <laughs> okay. I was in Ikodo in Ikeja. I was in Agege. I was in Munshin. I was in Shita. I was in the Island Masi. I was in Bodilon. I was everywhere. Bodilon has a joint. Yeah. Lucky here has so many. So many. So what I do is go to the joints, evangelizing. You no, know, bringing out the people that I can bring out and then pray for the ones that are still there. Thank God you. God bless you. Hallelujah. So, Erica, one word only and then we're getting up. We're shifting. Okay, what I want to say is this. Grace is different. Mm. And grace also expires. Mm. You might be doing something now. It might not be drugs. Mm. But it might be something else that can, only, that can also lead your life to destruction. Mm. But I think this avenue is that, that avenue for you to make a U-turn. Because it. you don't know what is going to happen to you tomorrow. Mm. I was saved. But there were other people in the joint. I've seen people die in the joint. And they would, they would just push them one side and we continue smoking. They would just shift them to one side. So some people also even going through recovery, they lose their life even before finding their purpose during the recovery. Your own will not be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. So please, whatever it is, if you're having emotional problems, like that is now the order of the day. Every youth is having one emotional problem like or the, the other. So cynical, it's it? not a bad thing to see a, a psychologist or a counselor. It is not bad. Kadam, we do counseling for free. You understand? Because when you don't talk about the issue, it keeps piling up and piling up and piling up. Then the next person you now go and talk to might not be the right person. It might be the wrongest because I remember going to talk in the school with girls. <laughs> and I told them, some of, most of them were sexually abused. Some of them are facing it. Have, um, they have, uh, they already started having sex at 14, 15, and they are good with it. And I said, talk to your counselor. They said, no, that, no, 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 no. That's the wrongest thing to do. That your can the counselors, the teachers, they would uh, use it to mock them. Please forget about what anybody wants to say. It is your life. It is not anybody's life. It's not your father's life. It's not your mother's life. It's not your friend's life. It is your life we are talking about. So do the needful. Take responsibility for your life. Don't play the blame game. I played the blame game. And it didn't work out for me. But thank God, I'm alive. If your case might not be the same thing. Stop. Fuck. Take responsibility for your life. That's it. That is it. Thank you very much.